So I have some bad news actually, which is the internet is not open. There's a kind of a fantasy that if you put something on the internet, it stays there. You have a right to do that. It's just going to happen. And uh, that's completely not true. Uh, the internet is not open in most countries uh, in the sense that there are things that are either banned or shoved offline by attackers. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The company I work for, Cloudflare, actually, who's heard of Cloudflare in this room? Those of you who have not heard of Cloudflare, you've used Cloudflare today. You just don't realize it. Uh, we operate in a gigantic network around the world, about 118 data centers in 57 countries. And if you've hailed a ride on your phone or gone to a popular website or your uh, wearable device has sent you a heart rate information back, uh, that's actually probably gone through us. We handle about 10% of the internet's uh, HTTP traffic. And what we do is we make it faster and make your experience better, but we also look for bad people and block them. <coughs> because we're everywhere in the world, we see every person on the world using the internet, every network in the world, and so we see actions that are taken around the world very quickly when they happen, in fact, almost immediately. And it's worth thinking about the sorts of things that make the internet not open. I want to talk about some recent government and court actions around the world. It's very, very easy to fall into the trap of thinking, if you say to somebody about block things being blocked on the internet, they instantaneously think China, and some will think Russia, and they sort of stop there. But if you go and look, blocking, outages, Banned websites are a global phenomenon. Most <coughs> countries have something they don't want online. So I'll just start with some recent things. This is the flag of Gabon. And in August of last year, there was an election, uh, the election between the incumbent president, Ali Bonga Ondimba, and his foreign, foreign minister, who was Jean Ping. And it was really close. Uh, the, the incumbent president got just over 170,000 votes and the foreign minister got 5,000 less. So incredibly close. And uh, well, what happened was this. People were very unhappy about Ali Bongo's rule and they, they had uh, enormous protests that started. And what the government decided to do was to try and clamp down on this. And the way they did that was they shut the internet off. So immediately once there was unrest, they cut the internet from the country. And this is what this looked like to Cloudflare. So each of those, Lines there is a day. These are the three major networks in Gabon, the mobile network, fixed telecom network. And the election happened on August, so on August the 31st, the unrest started, and that night the internet went dead. Completely cut off. And it was cut off for four days. So while this unrest was happening, and then it started to be put back on again. You'll notice also there's a little bit of, even when it was off, it wasn't quite off. We see that continuously. Someone in a privileged position still has internet access, um, or they haven't managed to do it successfully. And they cut it off completely to try and get this situation under control. And then they did something really interesting. They brought the internet back on, but they decided that it was not going to be on at night. So this is, you had internet in the day, and you had a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. internet curfew. And that continued for a while after this to get things under control. So that was, that was in 2016. Very recently, in Togo, there's also been protests again, this, against the, the, the regime. Uh, this is the beginning of September. And in order to get this under control, the government targeted very specifically one particular sort of internet access, which was mobile access. And the reason is, uh, within Togo, WhatsApp is incredibly popular, incredibly popular. And so they did this. So this is another graph from us. Th so that's Monday and Tuesday are the top two lines throughout the day, so you've got the internet's being used. And then on the Wednesday, the internet just sort of drops off. So people were have, their broadband might still be working, but mobile, which is how most people were getting internet access, was gone. And this sort of story is commonplace. If you've got a problem, cut the internet off. It happens all over the world. Another sort of way the internet isn't open is in countries like Turkey, and there's a long list, I've, I've picked random things, I'm not picking on Turkey in particular, where certain websites are banned, for example, Wikipedia. So Wikipedia is blocked in Turkey because of uh, 
things that the Turkish government doesn't like. This is done through the courts in Turkey, so there is actually a court order you can read about which will tell you why Wikipedia is considered to be dangerous. And as we think about these countries, you, you might have a kind of a perspective of these are countries that are not well developed or have a certain type of government. So I'd like to tell you about another country. This is Spain. So Spain is obviously a major part of Europe, a democracy, and uh, in a couple of days' time, there's a referendum happening in Catalonia. So the region of Catalonia has organized an illegal referendum, so under the, under the, under the law in, in Spain that's illegal, uh, asking for independence. The government of Spain has outlawed that and has done everything it can to stop access to information about it. And so if you go to the referendum website, which is ref1oc.cat, you get this message. So they, they seized the, the domain. The .cat is the Catalonia um, top-level domain. And you can't go there. So they were there. because that was within the country, they were able to do it. The people organizing the referendum moved to a .eu top-level domain. And you can visit that. If you were to visit that right now, you would see it. It's in Catalan, it's in Spanish, it's in English. Information about the referendum. If you visit that inside Spain, this is what you get. So what they've done here is there is a court order in Spain outlawing access to this website. And the way that is implemented is that the Spanish government went to their ISPs, Movistar, Vodafone, the major people, and said, you cannot allow people to have access to this website. And they're complying with a court order. So inside Spain, this is, this is an illegal website. And th there is a court order. And what they did, the ISPs, was they said, well, how do, we, so how do you do this? I mean, in the case of Togo and Gabon, these are, if you've got a country where there is one major telecom company, often state-owned, it's fairly easy. You go into, the, you say, cut off the internet. We've seen that in Tunisia and in Syria and other places. And you can do it. In a country like the UK or Spain, it's a bit more difficult. There are a lot of links, there's a lot of different companies, well, you get a court order, you make it the case that you know, they have to ban that, and then you poison DNS. So when, if you're inside Spain and you try and look up the domain name, what is the IP address for this domain name? This is what happens. It says, well, actually, that points to this guy over here, which is on Edge Suite, which is a major um, CDN provider, and it points to here. Now, that's not where it really points. It actually points to a website on my company's servers. But inside Spain, they've poisoned the DNS. And the infrastructure they're using, this is if you look at the page, is they're using the infrastructure of anti-phishing. So they already have a technical infrastructure to block people from going to phishing websites. That's a good thing. And they're implementing it, the same technology here, they're going in. And they're stopping you being to go to that web page and saying this is a phishing site. Actually, it's, it's for a referendum. So, if you were to go and look, survey countries, you would see across the world this type of thing happening, either a government action or a court action. Uh, for example, in the UK. So in the UK, there are some websites you can't visit. Has anyone gone to a banned website in the UK and seen this? So there's quite a long list of websites. This was a high court order outlawing access to certain websites. Again, implemented by the ISP, so British Telecom, Virgin, TalkTalk. Talk. Everybody has to stop you going from these websites. You attempt to get, look up the DNS name, and you don't get it. You either get nothing, your browser fails, and you think, oh, the website's not working, or you get this page. This is actually a website the ISP set up called ukispcourtorders.co.uk. And I actually find this kind of amusing. So if you go to the Pirate Bay, for example, uh, they, this page comes up, and it says, by the way, that website's banned. Here's a list of other banned websites. <laughs> and they give you all of them. And this scrolls on and on and on. So, by the way, you can look at these kind of things. But this is actually kind of an interesting way of dealing with this problem, which is to say, here's the reason why. And that's one of the things that's interesting, is to tell people what's happening. In the Spanish case, it literally says this website's been seized and doesn't tell you any information why. It doesn't, it doesn't tell you the court order. Here, they actually link to the court order. You can actually link and see this is the high court order. So that's government actions. But there's a more pernicious thing, which is denial of service. So this is a big problem. Even if, the, if, if a government doesn't stop you getting your website online, others who dislike you might. So back in September 2016, there's a very well-known investigative journalist called Brian Krebs who looks into cybercrime. He got hit by an enormous DDoS attack, 620 gigabits per second, and his, his web server went offline because he was disliked. 
There was nothing inherent in the internet to stop that. He, he got knocked offline. A month later, a, a, a company called Dyn in the US, which provides DNS services, got, also got knocked offline and took, off, took offline with it a lot of things that we use. And so if you think about openness, there is legal avenues where people try and stop you. And then there are people who hate you and try and knock you offline. And they do this using Internet of Things right now. So we hack into your Fitbit, or we hack into your camera at home, and we use it to send traffic. So a little one, this is a, this is a real attack uh, from October, two gigabits per second. Well, two gigabits per second, a good hosting provider might handle that. Um, and then a larger one, a month later, 360 gigabits per second. So this, you'll get knocked offline if you don't have some sort of protection for this kind of thing. And this is lasting hours, right? So this is hours and hours your website's offline. And the funny thing is this is easy to do. As one of the speakers said earlier, you can pay for this uh, and you'll pay a small number of dollars and someone will do it for you. And amusingly, this seems to be a job for some people. So this is Thanksgiving of last year. Uh, this is one of our customers, 400 gigabits per second all day long. Boom, it happened. And the funny thing is the same thing happened the next day and the next day. And after the third day, we're like, this is someone's job, right? So what was happening was, every day they were DDoSing the website, and in fact, they did it during business hours in the US, starting the day before Thanksgiving, all the way through the weekend. And I think they got mad here at the end, because it wasn't working, right? So, so, so DDoS is a real thing. I mean, it's, it's easy to do. There are people out there who you can pay to do it, and there are some people, if they hate you enough, will knock you offline, regardless of what it is. So what can we do? about this situation. I think there are, there are a couple of things we can do. As an industry, so in my industry, which is to do cybersecurity stuff as well as performance, we need to help people who are hurt by these kind of attacks. And so we operate a thing called Project Galileo, and Google operates a thing called Project Shield. And the idea of this is that if you are someone running an organization in human rights or arts, civil society, democracy, something which pisses someone off somewhere, um, we will protect you for free. And Google does the same thing with Project Shield, and I think other people can do this kind of thing, which is to give the kind of services. Because when you look at the size of some of these attacks, it's very difficult for a small organization that may be doing valuable work somewhere to pay for that kind of protection. So we built this thing called Project Calais. We essentially give our services away. And what we do is we get organizations like Amnesty, the ACLU, the EFF, Privacy International, journalists, to recommend things that need protecting. And I can't tell you the list of things we protect. It's about 500 websites, because they are very sensitive often in different parts of the world. But there are some who've been willing to put their logos up here. And it's literally around the world there are organizations that get attacked because of what they're saying online. And they, these are people trying to make the world better. And to give you an idea, they really do get attacked. I have some graphs. I cannot tell you who these people are. But this one is a large, so this is, this is a pretty mainstream uh, political organization in the US that some people hate. And this attack here, this is, this is very typical. They said, you know, they said something people didn't like, and they're going to get attacked. That there, you're looking at about um, a million. Uh, I think it's about a million requests in a day. This is a organization worldwide, a, a fairly well known worldwide organization. It gets attacked every weekend, and we don't actually know why, but somebody tries to knock it offline every weekend. And this is an organization in a small country uh, to do with LGBTQ rights and. That's, that's disliked. And you can see at some point they became well-known and people started trying to knock them offline. So we as an industry can really help. The other thing we can do is we can shine a light on government actions on the internet. And so some of you may have read Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, which is a book about censorship of books. And the internet, uh, the ITF has adopted a standard code, which is, you may well be familiar with 404 error. I can't find that page. There is a standard code, which is 451, which means this page is not available for legal reasons. And that helps shine a light if people realize you can't get here because of illegal action. And what we're doing at Cloudflare is if we get forced to block something, we're responding with that, saying this is why. It's, it's 451, first of all, it's a government action. And also, 
it is here's, if we can, we'll link to the court order and say this is why this is happening within that region. And I think by helping small organizations that need help with free services and by shining a light on when, stuff when it happens, that's the only way we'll help people because they have, you have to be able to decide what you think your government is doing and whether it's the right thing that they're doing. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.